for your generous gift, and you can be sure it'll be used for the upbuilding of the church. We're going to turn the service over now to Brother Dan. We look forward to listening to Doc a while. Uh, short and sweet today, wasn't it? Uh, glad to have everybody here today. I know the numbers are down, but we probably got more campgrounds than we got here today. So, you know, uh, we need to pray for them, and they're likely having service right now themselves, or have had, or will have soon. Uh, usually, when they get together for camping, they they take time to have have a service and have a message, and uh, I'm sure they're getting closer to the Lord as well. Uh, I too would like to welcome our visitors today. You don't get to be visitors here very often. You know, you, once or twice, and after that, you're just part of us. Okay? So glad to have you with us today. Uh, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 9. I would encourage everybody to, to turn with me and follow along. Um, as a human, I'm, I have a tendency to make mistakes. Uh, it, it, it just happens uh, pretty regularly sometimes. Uh, so keep an eye on me. Make sure I'm preaching according to God's word. And if I'm not, somebody needs to let me know. You don't have to come up and, and shake me by the collar and say you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, kind of bring me some scripture and, and, and help me out. Uh, I would appreciate that. Matthew chapter 9. In uh, chapter 8, toward the end of that, we see that, that Jesus was uh, in the country of the Gergesenes. And he had uh, met a couple men that were filled with the devil, and he got the devil out of them, and he went in the swine and went into the, into the water, and uh, then we find that uh, the people of the country of Gergesene asked Jesus to leave their country. Uh, they didn't want him there anymore. And then we go into chapter 9, it says, and he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. So he, he entered into, this, into the ship in the Sea of Galilee, and and traveled to Capernaum. It says, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. Now palsy, from what I've, what I've read on this, whether it's the same as a palsy today or not, but they said basically it means paralyzed. Uh, somebody that really wouldn't have been able to, to do much at all. And they brought him on a bed. He was lying on it. So these people carried him in on this bed. And it said, Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Notice he said, seeing their faith. Not the man sick of the palsy, but the, the man that were carrying him in. He saw their faith. And he said, son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. He saw the faith of these men that were carrying him in, and he, he looked at the man that had the palsy and said, thy sins be forgiven thee. And it says, behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth, saying, Jesus is a blasphemer. Well, blaspheme is, is not believing. It's, it's uh, saying things contrary to God, uh, opposing him. The, the more specific thing on this, we can go to Mark where it speaks of this same uh, thing. In Mark 2, verse 7, they said, why, does this man, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So they're saying he blasphemed because he tried to put himself in the place of God to forgive sins, which is something only God can do. They didn't understand who Jesus Christ was. He was allowed to do that because he had the power to do that. Uh, it says that they said this within themselves, but Jesus, it says, knowing their thoughts. You know, so it doesn't... People today, a lot of people don't, don't think about knowing their thoughts. I've had people... You know, I walk up behind somebody, they're in a conversation, and they, they say some foul language or something like that, and somebody will look at you and say, you know, there's a preacher behind you, a chaplain behind you. And they'll laugh and say, he ain't back there. They turn around and they, they, I've seen people blush. You know, they turn around and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And my response is, don't, you don't have to apologize to me, I'm not your judge. Your judge is with you 24-7. That's who you need to apologize to. You know, and, and, and I would appreciate it if they didn't talk like that, but, you know, people do in this world. And, and we need to understand that, but we need to not be, become a part of it. Um, but anyway, Jesus said his sins were forgiven him, and they said he blasphemed. 
And it says, knowing their thoughts, he said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. Jesus says, which is easier to say? Jesus had the ability to do either one. Which was easier? Yeah, he, he could have gone either direction. And he goes on and he says, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power, or the authority that we were talking about, because the Son of Man is God. He hath the power on earth to forgive sins. Then he saith to the sick of the palsy, he turned to him and he said, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. Which was easier, to forgive his sins or tell him to arise and, and take up his bed? So he went ahead and told him that too. And it says he arose and departed to his house. So this man that was with the palsy had to be carried in on a bed. He not only stood up and walked home, but he carried his bed with him. Now this, this is miraculous. This is the kind of thing Jesus did. This is the kind of thing that, that uh, many of the apostles did in the first century. And, and many others that were given miraculous gifts at that time. Um, verse 8 says, But when the multitude saw it, the other people that were there, when they saw this, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Notice that. They knew Jesus was a man. They saw him as a man. Not as God, but as a man. And they gave the credit to God. Because of what this man had done. Because what he did was not something that people would normally see. It was something that was totally against and contrary to what people would believe was possible at that time. People today see what they think is a miracle and they try to prove how it actually happened. A miracle is something that's contrary to what science says. It's something that's not supposed to happen. And that's what they did in those days. Was They, they worked these kind of miracles that... that made people believe, and that was the reason they had the miracles, was so people would believe that the ones that were doing this kind of thing were doing it of God, therefore, what they said and spoke was of God as well. In uh, Acts 14, Paul and uh, Barnabas were in Lystra, and uh, they healed, actually a man, it wasn't palsy, but he was lame, he wasn't able to walk, and they had him get up and walk, and he did. And the people there in life, they, they, they bowed down to Paul and Barnabas and called them Jupiter and Mercury and wanted to give them gifts. They looked at them as the gods. But here we see these people, they, they saw Jesus as a man, but they knew that the power, the great power that was in him was, was from God. Verse 9 says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom, or the, the tax office is what that is, and he said, unto him follow me. And he arose and followed him. How plain and simple. Now that's what faith is right there. It's doing what God says to do because God said do it. It's not arguing about it. It's not saying, but what do you want me to do that for, God? When God tells you to do something, you say okay, and you do it. And that's what Matthew did here. Matthew may have already been baptized in John's baptism, may have known that the Messiah was coming. It doesn't get into that here, so, you know, that's neither here nor there, I guess. But he, he did follow him. Whether he knew that it was the Christ, he saw the miracle that had just been worked. He knew that this man was, was of God in some form or fashion. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now in those days when you sat down to meet with somebody or sat down and ate with them, that was like family. I mean, you didn't just do this with an acquaintance. You know, when you sat down to eat, it, it was something special. And here they were saying that Jesus is eating with the publicans and sinners. Now, now we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but this was apparently like a special class of sinners. Ones that people could look at and say, ah, they must be sinners. But we've all sinned, every one of us. And the publicans were, they put them in a similar class as that of the sinners. Publicans or tax collectors were just con considered to be cheats. That's what they did. That's how they made their money. Anything over the other taxes they were allowed to keep for themselves. And it said, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciples, 
Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? The Pharisees wanted to know why he was eating. With these, with these people that, you know, they, they weren't righteous. They were people of, of lower esteem, people that, that, that he shouldn't have been eating with. Why would he lower himself to be with these people? They didn't understand it. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Notice there too, Jesus says right here that people need physicians, doesn't he? You know, I know there's some people that, that believe, you know, don't need to take anybody to the doctor. You know, if they don't have enough faith, you know, that's their problem. But Jesus says physicians are important. And physicians are who we need to go to when we're sick. Thank you, Doc. Uh, glad to have a physician among us. You know, and it, and it's, and it, it is. It's, it's, it's where we need to go when we're sick. But when we're well, you know, I, I, I like to see Doc anytime. But you know, when I'm well, I'm not going to make an appointment in his office and come over and just say, Doc, I just came in because I feel so good, and I just, you know, you don't do that. You go to the doctor when you're sick. And that's all Jesus was saying here. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He said, go and find out what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. To have mercy and not sacrifice in Ezekiel 34 Verse 1 through 4. Now Jesus is talking here to the Pharisees. He's responding to them and he's telling them they need to have mercy and not sacrifice. Chapter 34 of Ezekiel, the first several verses here, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do not feed them that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed them which are was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. He's telling the Pharisees here, you're supposed to be leaders, and all you do is care about yourself. You need to care about these other people. Have mercy on them. Not be calling, judging them and saying, well, they're publicans and sinners. What are you eating with them for? He tells them they need to have mercy and not sacrifice. He, he tells us elsewhere, I think it might be Hosea 6.6. 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So God would rather have mercy than sacrifice. We're told elsewhere he'd rather have obedience than sacrifice. Sacrifice is what was done when people sinned, when people came short of God's glory, and that's what they needed to do in, in Old Testament times. They had to continue to sacrifice. But he would rather people obey. He would have rather have people that are merciful to others. That's what God wants from each and every one of us. Verse 14, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Why is it that, that we're fasting for John, and, and the Pharisees are fasting, but your, your disciples aren't fasting? How come? Well, fasting is, is a sign of grief. It's a sign of, of anxiety. Um, and John, from, from what I read, John had already been put to death at this time. He was at least in prison at this time. We, we read actually a couple chapters later where he was put to death, but everything's not exactly in chronological order all the time. But John was not with them anymore. John had gone, whether he was in prison or, or deceased already. Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Jesus said, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Jesus was still with his disciples. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Then will they mourn. Then will they, you know, feel bad that, that they're gone. No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put into it 
in to fill it, in to fill it up, taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine in old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. The first, they're talking about the cloth. You don't take old cloth that's, that's uh, shrunk a little bit already, and sew a new piece of garment on it to patch it up, because when that new piece shrinks, the old isn't going to shrink anymore. And it's going to tear a bigger hole than what you had in the first place. In the same way with the bottle, you don't take an old bottle where the leather is already hardened and put new wine in it or grape juice because when it starts to ferment, it's going to make the bottle burst. You know, a lot of people look at this and say, well, this is a, this is a contrast between the Old and the New Testament. But that's just totally out of context with everything Jesus has been talking about. He's talking to the disciples of John. John said, I must decrease and he must increase. We're talking about life under John and how things were done at that time. And now how it's going to be under Jesus Christ. The old and the new. You don't, you don't mix them. You don't put them together. They're separate. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. In uh, Luke and Mark, where it speaks of this, they, the, the ruler says uh, she's almost dead or she's about to die or she's dying. Uh, here, you know, my daughter is even now dead. As far as he knew, she may have already been dead. Um, but in either case, it said Jesus rose and followed him, and so did the disciples. So Jesus was ready to go with him to, to uh, raise this young girl. And while he's on his way, though, it says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, she thought this, or didn't say it loud enough for anybody else to hear, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. She had the faith that she knew that this was Jesus Christ, and all she had to do was touch his garment. There wasn't anything special about that garment other than it was Jesus's, and he was wearing it. But in her mind, she understood that she could be healed by this man. But Jesus, turned, but Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. So here we see, now he's on his way to heal somebody else, and somebody else grabs the hem of his garment. She must have been coming in pretty low to grab the hem, whether she was crawling or whatever. But she grabbed the hem of his garment. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house, he continued on his way now, he's at the ruler's house, and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. You know what this was? They were lamenting. They were mourning. They were playing mournful music and crying. You know there was a little bit of a delay here from the time he was asked to go and the time he got there. Remember when Lazarus was dying? It took him three days. You know, he wanted to make sure that everybody knew that Lazarus was dead. It got to the point where he stinketh, we're told. Four days in the grave. And this is likely the same kind of thing, just a delay. Because when they got there, everybody, they were lamenting. They were playing mournful music. They were sad because this girl had died. They understood that she was dead by the time he got there. But it says, Jesus said to them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. This is the kind of laugh I think like, like Sarah gave to God when she found out when God said she was going to have a, a child. You know, it's kind of like it's unbelievable. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. That, that's not going to happen. It can't happen. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand. And the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. The things that Jesus was doing, people were seeing this. They were seeing these tremendous miracles that were happening. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. They knew him to be a son of David. Uh, 
which could be anybody that was Jewish, but they understood that the promised Messiah would be of the son of the lineage of David. And he, they said to have mercy on him, on them. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? You've asked me to have mercy on you. Do you believe that I can have mercy on you? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. They believed that Jesus Christ could do what they wanted. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. They understood who Jesus was, and they believed that Jesus could do these things. Because whether they believed that he was God at that time, or whether they believed that it was God working in him, they understood that this would happen, and they had that much faith. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. This is always kind of puzzling. Why would Jesus say, Don't tell anybody? But you know, if, if he went out and said, go tell everybody how great I am, that's not going to look well on him. But if he humbles himself and says, don't tell anybody, you know, I'll tell you what, if somebody healed my eyesight, I'd tell everybody. And then Jesus knew these men would do that. they go out and say, I can see, I can see. I mean, losing your eyes, I can't imagine what it would be like to be blind and have to walk around not, not seeing anything. Um, but there are people in the world like that. And if they had their eyes restored, you can imagine what a great thing it would be and how much they would want to tell everybody. But Jesus said, don't tell anybody about it. Keep it a secret. But I, I, I believe Jesus knew that they would go out and tell others. And that way, when, when People turn to Jesus and say, oh, he thinks himself to be some great man. Somebody else said, no, he told us not to tell. He didn't want us to tell. See that no man knoweth it. Verse 31 says, but they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a, a dumb man possessed with the devil. Now, in the previous chapter, there were two men possessed with the devil, and they were hollering and screaming, uh, Jesus, Son of God. Uh, you know, and, and they were yelling and everything else. This guy was dumb, or, or meaning he can't speak. So the devil doesn't work in everybody the same way. You know, and even the way the devil works in us today, he's working in all of us a little different. He's going after the things that's going to play on our mind and try to get us to do things we shouldn't or think things that we shouldn't. You know, if he attacked me the same way he attacked somebody else in here, it might be some areas that don't give me any problem anyway, and vice versa. So he attacks each one of us in a different way. And here you see how it affects different people in a different way. The devil and the ones made them holler and scream and, and uh, made the men fierce that they were inside of. And this one we see, he can't speak. He's, he's dumb. Um, he was possessed with the devil and in verse 33 it says that when the devil was cast out the dumb spake he got the devil out and the man was able to speak now and the multitudes marveled saying it was never so seen in Israel the multitudes again were marveling you know and I, back earlier where it talked about the, the Pharisees asked about it and it said the multitudes marveled it didn't really say what the that was back in verse uh Seven, where the man arose and departed and carried his bed home. And then uh, verse 8 said the multitudes marveled. It didn't say what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees were accusing him. And then, and then they see this man get up and walk out. This man that he had said, your sins are forgiven. And we see, the, we see that, that uh, uh, the Pharisees, I don't, I don't know what they would have been doing. I guess just dropping their head. There wasn't anything they could say about it. Maybe that's why they were just left out anyway. But the Pharisees said on this one, never so, in, in, never so seen in Israel, but the Pharisees said, he casteth out devils through the prince of devils. They accused him of being able to cast out these devils by the prince of peace and by the prince of the devils himself. Uh, in Matthew 12, this was addressed. 
And Jesus said a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. That they had to to, to work together and, and, and Satan wouldn't wouldn't be having him cast devils out. That would be Satan against Satan. So that wasn't going to happen. And he explained that to him, and that's more in Matthew 12. Verse 35 says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He didn't just pick and choose the ones. He didn't just say, you know, well, you have faith, so you're healed, but you weren't healed because you didn't have faith. It didn't take the other person's faith. It took Jesus' faith. It's when uh, Peter and John on, on the, uh, the temple, when they were by the Bethesda, by the pool, I guess it was, they healed a man. They didn't heal him because of his faith. They healed him because of the faith that they had. Today we see a lot of people that say you don't, you don't have the faith. That's why you weren't healed. Today, we don't ever see anybody raise anybody from the dead that claims to have these kind of powers. They don't do it. But at that time, they did, and Jesus Christ was, was not only a great teacher, but a great miracle worker. In uh, verse 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You know, we're, we're told of Jesus in uh, Hebrews 4. For we have not a high priest which cannot be t touched with our feelings, with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ did feel the infirmities of the people. Jesus Christ did. He was concerned greatly about these people that were scattered as, as sheep that had no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. There's a tremendous harvest out there, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of people that accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's it. That's where it ends for them. We're all ministers. We all need to get out and talk to other people. We've all got friends and relatives that don't know the Lord. We don't have to be able to preach a sermon. We don't have to be able to tell everybody everything there is to know. When somebody asks us questions about the scriptures and we don't know the answer, we say, I don't know. And you get the Bible out and look so that you'll both have an answer. We need to learn how to, how to study the Word. We need to learn how to get into it. We need to be able to help others that, that have questions about the Lord. Verse 38 says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Paul says that he plants in the palace waters, but it's God that gives the increase. We need to be planters and waterers. We need to continue to tell others about the Lord. And, and, and like I said, you don't have to be a preacher to be able to do that. you got friends, that, loved ones, that you can just tell them how, how the Lord affects your life. What, what a difference he makes in your life. We're told to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us a question of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to be able to tell them about that hope that's in us. We need to be able to testify and tell others how great God is working in us. Back in Ezekiel 34, I read some verses here earlier, but I want to read 6 through 8 now. In Ezekiel 34, it says, My sheep wandered through all the mountains and every high hill, Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. That's the same kind of thing Jesus is talking about in Matthew 9. There's sheep out there that don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. That's what Jesus wanted these Pharisees to do, to have mercy upon these people, to be like Matthew was when he said, follow me to get up and do what Jesus would have you to do. 
God doesn't want every one of us to do the same thing. He's got different things for every one of us. And he doesn't expect everybody to do the same thing. But one thing he does expect is for every Christian to do the very best they can. That sounds like a great deal. But it's what the Lord requires of us. It's what the Lord wants us from us. It's for us to do the very best we can in whatever way he's called us. We need to follow him like Matthew did. If you're not a Christian today, I invite you to come forward during this closing song. If you've heard the word and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you need to repent. It's simply asking the Lord to, to help you start living for Him, making a commitment to Him and turning your life around, turning away from an evil life and turning toward a, a life of Christ. That's repentance. If you've heard the word and you believe and you've repented, we ask you to come forward during this closing song. Jesus also said, uh, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. So we need to confess Jesus Christ. And if you come forward today and you want to give your life to Christ, we'll give you that opportunity to confess Jesus Christ right here, right now, before the people that are in this congregation. Confession before men. Jesus also said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And on the day of Pentecost, when people, when the kingdom came, when it, when it first started, when the church began, people said, what must we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you're not a Christian today, you need to have the Holy Ghost dwelling in you. You need to give your life to Christ. You need to have that old man put to death in the watery grave and rise up to walk in the newness of life. Jesus also said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So we need to continue faithful. As Christians, we need to be faithful. We need to help one another. We need to be able to show mercy to one another. We need to be able to tell others about the Lord and how he's affected our lives. This time, let us stand and sing number 507, sowing the seed of the kingdom. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom?